Bueno, antes de seguir en inglés, quiero simplemente decir que estoy muy feliz de estar aquí, um, de tener la oportunidad de compartir contigo, uh, con ustedes, <ríe> uh, mi, uh, mis experiencias. Y um, quiero agradecer al ITD y también a ustedes para quedar hasta el, casi el final de, de, de la conferencia. Um, Lida has already said a little bit of the background that I come from. Um, and uh, so I'm going to speak both of my experience of working with companies and working with NGOs, particularly my own work with Oxfam. Um, I also, uh, a lot of my comments today are informed by some current research I'm doing with IFAD on public-private producer partnerships. So a lot of the examples will relate to agriculture, to farmers, and to value ch agricultural value chains. But I do believe that the principles and some of the learning are relevant for other sectors. So uh, just very briefly, before I really get into um, public-private people-producer partnerships, I want to just say something about NGO business partnerships, because I think there's some learning from that. Um, and then I want to talk about a couple of uh, uh, sort of enabling factors that, that we've learned through the work with IFAD, as well as some of the unanswered questions related to partnerships. So um, talking about NGO business partnerships first, I think in, in the UK, I, I might be wrong, but my perception is we were some of the earlier mutants in terms of NGOs and business working together. Um, but it, it really started first from uh, NGOs campaigning against business. So here's an example of the clean clothes campaign against sweatshop labor. Um, and then uh, there was sort of a, a next step which tried to work with markets to use mar market mechanisms and, and, and have activism through them. So shareholder activism is an example. Uh, then there was a step. Um, I give an example here from the UN Global Compact, not technically an NGO, but, but also um, in the UK, Amnesty International, Greenpeace set up business groups in, in the late 90s um, to see how they could engage business uh, to use their influence towards the, the aims the NGOs were seeking. Um, and then we had a move into a more, um, part, more sort of truer partnerships, if you like, for example, around inclusive business. So this is an example from Oxfam and Unilever. Uh, I believe it's in Vietnam. Um, but what I want to say is it's, it's not an evolution. It's not that one form is better than the other. In fact, Oxfam, for example, uses all four of these forms currently. Um, and, and it's about choosing the right tool at the right time. And, just to give an example, Oxfam's partnering with Unilever, but they're also campaigning against or to change the practices of the 10 largest food companies, which happens to include Unilever. Um, so sort of moving from NGO business partnership to talk a little bit more about um, public-private producer partnerships. Um, the research I mentioned with IFAD, uh, we're actually launching next week in Rome. So I'm, I'm being a little bit cheeky by previewing a few of the um, findings from the report. And I, I don't want to dwell too much on that, but I thought it was useful to just briefly talk about two of the cases we looked at, just to give some context to the rest of the comments. So um, we looked at four case studies in Rwanda, Uganda, Indonesia, and Ghana. Um, the diagram I, I acknowledge is a bit complicated, but what you need to see here is uh, the orange represents the farmers, the blue represents the private sector, the gray represents the public sector, and the green is the, the value chain. Um, in this case, it was uh, in the tea sector. And in Rwanda, it was a partnership between the government and a local uh, business consortium as part of the government's privatization of the tea sector, which had been um, completely state-owned in Rwanda. Uh, the private sector was uh, investing in a new tea processing factory, bringing technical and managerial skills. The government was providing infrastructure, roads, electricity, organizing the farmers and uh, enabling their access to production loans. Also, it was interesting that um, through the government and IFAD, they also ensured the farmers had a 15% equity share in the factory that was set up. 
The results, uh, as we saw them, I mean, this is a partnership that's still in process. We looked um, at a moment in time, but it seemed to be producing some improvements in incomes. We saw uh, farmers, uh, households gaining access to new assets, so um, dairy cows, some small uh, animals as well, some improvements in food security. Yields were increasing from a very low level um, to uh, 0.1 tons per hectare per year to something like 2.5 tons per hectare per year, but um, they had predicted yields would be more around six tons, so it was still well below what they had, had hoped for through this partnership, at least so far. And there were many reasons for this, but one of the reasons is they found farmers were not properly implementing the improved crop techniques they were expecting them to. They weren't doing the weeding and the, the um, pruning uh, as expected. They weren't fully using fertilizers. And this was affecting or threatened to affect the sustainability of the loans the farmers had taken on, um, as well as it was undermining the productivity of the factories. They were only running at 30 to 40 percent of their nominal capacity. Moving to Ghana, um, another case we looked at, um, a more complicated partnership. Uh, so one of the learnings is partnerships don't all look the same. Um, here, it was really the government was working with a local aggregator called SFMC, the Savannah Farmers Marketing uh, Company. And it was also working with Nestle around increasing maize productivity and, um, and quality as well. Really key uh, is the sort of complicated structure on the left-hand side. These were the district value chain committees, and they brought together farmers, local private sector actors, so input suppliers, um, local banks, as well as the local government. And it created a sort of a cashless credit system that was to support the increased productivity of the farmers. And in fact, here we saw a good story around productivity. There were, were fairly substantial increases. Um, some increases in incomes, although some communities reported that, well, they, had, uh, they were selling more, their costs had also gone up. So overall, they were more or less breaking even. But there were challenges. Both the farmers and the aggregator at times were reneging on their agreement. They weren't uh, living up to what they said they were, were going to, to do in terms of selling and buying maize. Um, poor weather some years meant crop failure and uh, farmers were the, there were problems in terms of loan recovery by the rural banks. I um, mean, in fact, when we were there last year, one of the major, one of the most important rural banks was saying they weren't going to give any new loans this year as a result. So, um, just sort of building on that, uh, we, we drew out eight enabling factors of, of what learning we took from those and other cases we looked at of, of what was important for public-private producer partnerships to work. And the first, um, in a way it seems obvious, and it certainly reflects a lot of what's been talked about in the last two days, but that you need to have farmer ownership of the, partner, of the partnership. That, you know, the, these agreements required activities, investments, efforts, not just from the public and private sector, but from the farmers themselves. But they weren't part of the negotiation in general, they weren't part of the design of the partnership, and so you know, it's questions about whether the, the arrangements really fully reflected their interests. And I think in Rwanda, the, the example with the poor crop maintenance is, you know, sort of bears that out, that um, the farmers were not fully bought in, despite having a 15% equity share in the factory. Um, a second point was that um, we heard leaders say that partnerships are responses to, to complexity, to wicked problems. But then we need to understand that partnerships need to be able to respond to complexity as well. They need to be able to operate in complexity. Um, markets are complex, adaptive systems. And what this means is, um, and I, I really um, was interested in, in Julio's comments yesterday about development needing to move away from linear approaches, and I think it it's resonates here as well. That um, uh, and it is well something that Ken just said. You know, individual actors have different understandings of the system depending on where they sit, and unless you're um, building the partnership and the arrangements, taking into account these different understandings, you know, no one individual is going to be able to properly understand the full system. But also the system responds to, uh, to 
developments, it responds to interventions, it responds to disruptions in sometimes quite unpredictable ways. It's made up of interrelationships between different actors and different processes. And you cannot always predict how an intervention is, is actually going to play out. So partnerships need to be able to be flexible and to adapt and to spot where things are working really well and to amplify that and spot where things are not working well and, and to, to dampen those effects. And finally, um, and the issue again that's come up a lot is about scale. So um, I want to share with you a quote that I, I really like from the Shell Foundation. And they, they say that when the Shell Foundation was set up in 2000, they really had this belief that a combination of private sector actors uh, were going to be able to catalyze and scale market-based solutions to big global challenges such as energy access. But actually, as they got working in the intervening years, they found that, uh, well, pioneer social enterprises were needed to be able to tackle problems at scale. They alone are insufficient to solve the entrenched problems that they were facing. They said, we will need many thousands of inclusive businesses adopting similar models to make any type of dent on the challenges that affect half the world's population. Um, and I, I think, you know, part of the point here is, you know, that the, the private sector does have um, skills and, and finance and resources to bring, but also that the private sector has relatively little incentive to think beyond its own value chains. Why would a company provide extension services to farmers that they're not buying from? Why would a company build a distribution system so that uh, consumers could buy one of their competitors' products? So I think the my point here is that governments are really important. Um, I also think, uh, going back to my examples, that. Quite, it's quite interesting what they're doing in Ghana. Um, so the Rwanda example, I think, at first look, had, had a bigger impact in that it, um, it was w operating in two communities, and, and it was fairly transformative in a way because it was not just supporting those households, but it was creating more economic activity in the area. But in Ghana, they were working over a much larger area, much more diffuse impacts, but they, they were working with multiple private sector actors, in, indirectly and directly. They weren't all through formal partnerships with a signed agreement, but there was involvement of local uh, private sector actors. There was involvement of, of the aggregator and then the, the, the larger companies. So, you know, it, it, the point is it, it's about systemic scale change. So, uh, again, thinking about Zach yesterday, it's not about individual products, but it's about going to, to thinking about how the system works. So, um, finally, I just wanted to say that, you know, despite taking some learning of how we think partnerships can work or, or factors that can enable partnerships to work, there were some challenges that I think we were unable to respond to in the research that we did. And one of them is about whether private sector approaches, so whether partnerships with the private sector can really be expected to reach the most marginalized communities. Or does the commercial incentive, the, the profit incentive mean that they can perhaps go so far, but there's a certain threshold beyond which you need public sector approaches, NGO approaches. Secondly, a question about whether um, PPPs or uh, public-private producer partnerships reinforce or weaken the role of the state or um, alleviate the state of their responsibility. So um, anecdotally, this is not from the IFAD research, but it was a conversation I was having um, where it became apparent that one uh, government official from an African country had come to the conclusion that in a certain region they didn't need to worry about extension services for farmers anymore because the private sector was doing it. Um, and then finally, uh, evidence of impact. I think this is one of the biggest issues with um, a lot of the excitement about partnerships is actually I don't think there's very good evidence one way or the other about the actual impacts. And, and the research we did, unfortunately, was not really looking at, 
at impact. It was looking at partnership dynamics, and it certainly wasn't looking over a long enough time frame. But we really need uh, more investment by governments, by donors, in trying to establish whether or not partnerships work from a development perspective over a long time frame, looking at multidimensional impacts and not just income and inclusion of farmers or, or other communities. Uh, so just to include, I have one second, I'm going to go over my time, but uh, <laughs> this is my last slide, just to say, so what we've learned is ownership and involvement of all partners is key, including the fourth P, whether that's people or producers, the need for flexibility to respond and adapt, and the need to look for large-scale and long-term impacts, which I think come at an industry or, or a system level. But the outstanding questions about reaching the most marginalized, about how this affects the role of the public sector and about the actual impacts. Gracias. <laughs>